Opium detox and recovery, accepting and trusting unstoppable collapse. I'm Michael Dowd and I'm recording this on Cinco de Mayo of 2022. It happens to be my son's 37th birthday. Hope is a dangerous barrier to acting courageously in dark times. In hope, the soul overreaches reality, as in fear, it shrinks back from it. To define hopium, I've got three definitions. Hopium is a comforting vision of the future that requires breaking the laws of physics, biology, or ecology. Hopium is addiction to false, literally impossible hopes. And hopium is irrational or unwarranted optimism that promises short-term relief, but delivers crushing disappointment and despair when reality inevitably bites. I love this quote. Hope and fear are inseparable. There is no hope without fear, nor any fear without hope. They're two sides of the same coin. So I suggest that only trust can free us from the roller coaster of hope and fear. And staying sane in a crazy world, I suggest, starts with understanding and accepting reality as it really is, especially the things that you really don't like. And that's the key, because we all have denial instincts. Denial is the largely unconscious habit of thought whereby we refuse to accept the reality of things that are bad or upsetting, or that challenge our worldview, our legacy, how we live, what is required of us, and or our feelings of self-worth or superiority. Denial is also the instinctual impulse to reject or discount information that calls into question our hopes, assumptions, or expectations about the future. I have denial instincts, you do, everybody we know and love does, so we can have compassion for ourselves and each other. And often denial gets a bad rap because it's often adaptive inattention. As Stephen Jenkinson says, inattention to the world's ecological state is well advised because attention to it mitigates against your happiness, your contentment, and your sense of well-being. Having a conscience now is a grief-soaked proposition. Whatever spiritual awakening may have meant in past times and places, if you awaken in our time, you awaken with a sob. Turns out that grief is absolutely necessary and nourishing. I love this, another quote from Stephen Jenkinson. Grief requires us to know the time we're in. The great enemy of grief is hope. Hope is the four-letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. Our time requires us to be hope-free, to burn through the false choice of being hopeful or hopeless. They are two sides of the same con job. Grief is required to proceed. And I love this quote from Joanna Macy, the depth of your grief is the measure of your love. You wouldn't be feeling grief if you didn't love. Now, of course, grief isn't just a feeling. Grief is their set of stages. These are Kubler-Ross's famous stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, and then on the other side of acceptance, what Paul Traferka calls finding the gift, trust. There's a whole range of benefits that only come from full acceptance and trust. And this really is doom. These are post-doom, hope-free. And uh, I first heard from Guy McPherson, uh, he adds another stage of grief, which is gallows humor. I see that as actually one of maybe 15 to 20 different benefits, uh, but certainly one of them is gallows humor. Please note, the post apocalyptical fiction section has been moved to current affairs. I know you wrote this as a bleak vision of a dystopian future, but today we can sell it as a fond remembrance of the good old days. A few of us are going out after work to pretend it's not the end of the world if you want to join us. Gallows humor is essential. So, this is a key point. Sustainable means faithful to the future. Unsustainable means unfaithful or betraying of the future. And I suggest that everything else is but a footnote or a distraction. A lot of people don't understand why morality evolved. What was the purpose evolutionarily of morality? And yes, I'm talking about good and evil. It's to ensure fidelity to the future. That's the fundamental role of life ways is to ensure, or what we would call religion, but religion hasn't been doing its job in recent centuries, but it's to ensure fidelity to the future. Because every culture needs to attend to ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. 
So good is what promotes or encourages or supports ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness, usually in that order. And evil is what diminishes or destroys or degrades ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. This is not moral rocket science. We don't need 10 commandments to tell us this. So here's the thesis of my program. Hopium is uniquely seductive and destructive as it blinds us to seeing, hearing, and feeling reality as it really is. There's no more consequential betrayal of the future than our collective denial of the already unfolding and unstoppable nature of biospheric and civilizational unraveling, disintegration, and collapse. It's impossible to calculate the suffering and geological scale evil that will unfold this decade and next if billions of us don't go through hopium detox and recovery as soon as possible. So I wanna reiterate, I'm suggesting that th there's nothing more consequential in terms of betrayal of the future than our denial of what's really the case, which is we are in unstoppable collapse. And it's impossible to calculate the suffering individually, communities and the geological evil that we unknowingly participate in if billions of us don't go through hopium detox and recovery. I realize these are bold statements. That's the purpose of me making this, this video. Now, hopium causing geological scale evil? What the heck am I talking about? Well, there are 440 nuclear reactors worldwide, requiring us to assume that industrial civilization has everlasting life. Yet we are already 25 to 30 years into abrupt runaway climate change. So the 64 million year question, not $64 million, but the 64 million year question is, as industrial civilization continues to collapse faster and faster, how many Chernobyl or Fukushima-like or worse meltdowns due to wildfires, hurricanes, droughts, tsunamis, power grid failures, political instability or terrorism do you think are possible, likely, inevitable? And I realized the claim that we're 25 to 30 years into abrupt climate change, I'll make the case and show where that's coming from, but uh, it, it, it's factually the case, evidentially. So this is the most important book I've ever read in my life, Overshoot by William Catton, The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change. I suggest if you only read one book the rest of your life, if you really want to understand our predicament, read this one. Many people consider it the most important book of the 20th century. I love this quote. Today, humanity is locked into stealing ravenously from the future. That is what this book is about. A major aim is to show that commonly proposed solutions for problems confronting us are actually going to aggravate those problems. In order to truly understand our predicament and not make things worse, we need a clear-headed ecological interpretation of history. And this is the, this is the point that hopium causes people to think for, look for solutions to our problems. We're not facing problems. We're facing a predicament that has no solutions. And most of what we're trying and are envisioning trying will make things worse. So I suggest that the number one cause, this is again, a bold claim I'm making, that of climate anxiety, environmental dread, and doomed to fail anti-future policies is hopium. Hopium addiction sabotages our ability to think, feel, and live in right relationship to reality. Without an ecological understanding of history and human nature, people invariably have distorted views of what is possible. Hopium thus leads good people to set their sights on what will ultimately lead to geological scale evil. And young activists are especially prone to hopium fantasies, which is why so many high profile peddlers are so ubiquitous. And again, this is the main point I'm making here. This is why I'm creating this video. This is of utter importance. Here's some examples just in the last month. Okay, Doomer and the climate advocates who say it's not too late. This was in the New York Times. A growing chorus of young people is focusing on climate solutions. It's too late means I don't have to do anything and the responsibility is off me. Alania Wood, a sustainability scientist in Tennessee who takes to TikTok to communicate much of her climate messaging. The science says things are bad, but it's only going to get worse the longer we take to act, she says. So that's why I'm creating this is that 
it's not too late for some things and it's way too late for other things that if we try to pursue them as if it's possible, we'll make things worse. There are no climate solutions. I hope by the end of this program, you will absolutely trust why that's the case. And the longer it takes to act, some actions are good and some actions are bad. I'll conclude this program on what it's not too late for and what it is too late for and the importance of making that distinction. Here's some others. Climate optimism. We have reasons for hope on climate change. Stopping climate change is doable, but the time is short, the United Nations panel warns. Why our hope for the planet is not yet extinct. In fact, here's a quote from Margaret. An internal dialectic between hope and despair governs my days. The more necessary it becomes to create a hopeful future, the harder it is for me to imagine one. Now, here's what I'm suggesting is that hopium, such as these three articles, this is hopium that will result in dozens of nuclear meltdowns, billions of depressed, angry people, countless needless extinctions, and immeasurable time and money wasted. Here's some more. Actually, humanity can still overcome climate catastrophe. This is the Washington Post and Associated Press. No obituary for Earth. Scientists fight climate doom talk. And then this one, this is six and a half million views um, just in the last month. We will fix climate change. Here are solutions that can only make things worse. Finding the right dose for solar geoengineering. Solar geoengineering could have global temperature increase without making climate change worse, research shows. That's from Harvard. And then MIT Technology Review, CRISPR, creator says that we could engineer species to fight climate change. This is guaranteed to make things worse. Joseph Tainer in his famous book, one of the things I've been doing the last nine years is studying the rise and fall of civilizations. And this is a classic, the collapse of complex societies. He talks about how adding more complexity and adding more technology always makes things worse at some point. And then this book, Technofix, Why Technology Won't Save Us or the Environment. It's a profound book. Here's some of the main points. That human technology that doesn't integrate with nature's technology, life's technology, does more harm than good. It just does it over time. Technology in the context of ongoing economic growth does not promote sustainability, but hastens collapse. Who do you think said this? Growth economics is not science. It's an idolatrous religion. Now, that's something I would have said. And in fact, I have said such things. But this is from the former senior economist at the World Bank, Herman Daly, one of the founders of ecological economics. I mean, idolatrous religion? I mean, demonic economics? What? Well, here's a couple of cartoons. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Or this one. And so while the end of the world scenario will be rife with unimaginable horrors, we believe that the pre-end period will be filled with unprecedented opportunities for profit. Here's the full quote. Growth economics is not science. It is an idolatrous religion. It is not science because it flies in the face of the first and second laws of thermodynamics and ignores ecology. It is idolatry because it conceives of mankind as an all-powerful creator rather than as a creature subject to limits. I love this quote from John Michael Greer, the first law of life is limits. And here's the thing, whatever, whatever you put your faith or trust in, your God is whatever you put your faith or trust in. And that was your ultimate concern. And this isn't just Michael Dowd saying this, arguably the most influential theologian of the 20th century, Paul Tillich, famously identified faith as your ultimate concern. So if your ultimate concern is technology or the market, that's your God. So back here to some of the main points of this book. Most technological solutions to social and technology-created problems are counterproductive. And this book shows why new technologies tend to be uncritically accepted, who really controls the direction of change, and why technology expands and accelerates ecocide. One of the most common things you'll hear is what I call the ecocidal hubris of the almighty we. It's a secular religious faith in omnipotent human agency. The fact that we can think it, therefore we can do it. Progress and development, biosphere management, 
climate restoration, otherwise known as geoengineering, global scale mobilization, species level awakening, the evolution of consciousness. All of these are examples of the hubris of the almighty we. And how many times have you read a book and it's got, you know, nine chapters of doom and then the last chapter is the happy chapter, right? You know, well, if we all just do this, you know, it's not too late to stop the worst of climate change if we all accept reality and work together for the common good. Those are the three words. If we all, you know that you're dealing with the almighty we. Yeah, we're screwed. <laughs> so what's wrong with hope? Why not let people believe whatever they want to if it helps them get through their day without depression or despair? Well, on the personal level, hope is a booby prize. And while acceptance can be redemptive, it is trust that transforms lives. The quality, of you, if, you, if you have terminal cancer, being in denial about that is not going to benefit the quality of your life at all. That's, that's the silly thing. That's the stupid thing is that if you understand it, then you can make changes, you can complete relationships in your life, you can attend to how you die, you can attend to, to, to making amends. There's so many things to do, to, that, to do that's positive if we accept the reality that we are part of a larger system, industrial humanity, that's on its way to a fairly rapid extinction for very well-known reasons. Societally, the anger and the passion of youth can be channeled for good when we accept that we're in collapse rather than evil, which is what multi-billion dollar corporations are trying to get young people to passionately argue for things that will just make things worse. They have to, because they're technology-based. A critical mass of acceptance is needed for collective action regarding long-term toxicity, such as capping the nukes and preventing the meltdown of, of uh, you know, the spent fuel rods, assisting species in migrating, the wise use of time and money and also reducing suffering. There's a lot, just because we can't save everything doesn't mean that there's not a tremendous amount of good that we can do in our remaining time. And I suggest these are moral imperatives that you will not attend to, that we will not attend to if we're in denial about unstoppable collapse. Hopium blinds us from acknowledging the urgency for investing time, energy, and resources in all things regenerative, supporting indigenous resistance, values, and life ways, where biodiversity is being protected most fiercely and most effectively all around the world. Usually, indigenous peoples are leading that fight. Sequestering human-made toxins that nature cannot undo. Safely dismantling the relics of infrastructure no longer in use, such as dams rewilding rivers and other animal migration pathways, assisting plants, especially trees, in migrating poleward. I suggest these are moral imperatives. So the rest of this program, you could just basically say, well, that's Michael Dowd's opinion, but the rest of this is uh, Hopium Detox and Recovery, a program. Uh, it, I humorously call it Hopaholics Anonymous, ha, right? Because the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. I don't need to say anything about this. So this is your moment. If you turn off this right now and decide to take the blue pill, I can only honor you for that because you may not be emotionally ready, because what I'm about to show you is the evidence that's, that's compelling. It's frankly compelling. So if, you, if you're really terrified that what I'm saying is true, I suggest you turn this off, because if you click this, you're taking the red pill, and you're going to see how far this rabbit hole goes. All right, you were warned. The stability of the biosphere has been in decline for centuries and an unstoppable collapse for decades. This great acceleration of technology and market-driven ecocide is an easily verifiable fact. The scientific evidence is overwhelming. Evidence is also compelling that the vast majority of people will deny this, especially those still benefiting from the existing order, those legitimately concerned about the consequences of collapse, and those who fear that accepting reality means giving up. And yes, most of us uh, fit in that paragraph there somewhere. 
the history of 80 or more previous boom and bust societies, progress, regress, you know, clearly reveals how and why Homo Colossus, which is William Catton's term for industrial humanity, where each of us as part of Homo Colossus uses 30 to 50 times the resources and exudes 30 to 50 times the waste as normal Homo sapiens. So the history of 80 plus previous boom and bust societies clearly reveals how and why Homo Colossus is destined for near term extinction. That may or may not mean the extinction of Homo sapiens, we just don't know, but it certainly means the extinction of Homo Colossus. And paradoxically, acceptance, trust, may be the only thing that can help us not make a bad situation much worse, as well as help us to live fully, fearlessly, and meaningfully, even at Teotihuacan, that is the end of the world as we know it. And make no mistake, we are living in Teotihuacan. These are the real end times. We are already two to three decades into abrupt runaway and exponentially accelerating climate mayhem. And I don't want you to take my word on this. This is from the IPCC. This shows the carbon in the atmosphere. Now, notice all of the different COPs, all the different agreements, the pledges that people have made, right? You can see those, right? Well, in the 1960s, carbon dioxide was rising at about 0.9 parts per million per year. In the 1970s, 1.3 parts per million per year. In the 1980s and 90s, one and a half parts per million per year. In the 2000s, uh, two parts per million per year, 2010s, 2.4 parts per million for, per year, and it's now already above 2.5 parts per million uh, already in 2022. And that's just the CO2. If you add methane and nitrous oxide, we're over 500 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent. So I'm going to shift now to talking about why this was inevitable, why we can't stop this, why this is thousands of years in the making, because we're used to thinking of civilized as good and primitive is not good, right? Well, these quotes call that into question. Forests precede civilizations and deserts follow them. All of our exalted technological progress, civilization for that matter, is comparable to an ax in the hand of a pathological Civilization is a hopeless race to discover remedies for the evils it produces. The end of the human race will be that it will eventually die of civilization. The earth is littered with the ruins of empires and civilizations that once believed they were eternal. This is not an exaggeration. Turns out the collapse is a feature of all anthropocentric or human-centered civilizations. In fact, a few years ago, the uh, BBC did a deep civilization series, and uh, Luke Kemp published an article called, Are We on the Road to Civilization Collapse? And of course, he answered yes. And he has this chart that shows 88 ancient civilizations. This is just from 3000 before the Common Era to 1000 of the Common Era. If you go back before 3000 BCE, or you look at the last thousand years, we're well over 100. And as Arnold Toynbee, the famous 20th century historian said, great civilizations are not murdered. They take their own lives. And we actually know how. Here's how human-centered, anthropocentric civilizations commit suicide, commit ecocide. And this is just the last 5% of human history. The last 8,000 years, roughly 400 generations, as opposed to 20,000 generations in terms of the first 95% of human history, where we live more or less sustainably. Over 80 examples. This process typically takes between 225 and 325 years. You see progress, rise, boom, overshooting of the carrying capacity is that whole process. It's not just the peak. And then regress, fall, or bust. And this is an unstoppable process of collapse. In over 80 examples, there's not a single example in human history of a civilization becoming sustainable on the way down. It's utterly un unstoppable. But the inner world, the feelings, the expectations, the emotional world of people makes a difference when you were born and when you die. For example, if you're born in times of progress or expansion or economic growth, whatever, and you die during that time, well, of course, you expect your kids and your grandkids going to have it better than you, easier, wealthier, whatever. And if you're born and die in times of fall, of times of bust, in times of regress, um, well, of course, your kids and grandkids are going to have it more difficult than you. I mean, it's just the way things are. 
It's when you're born in times of expansion and it shifts in your lifetime. Well, that's what we call suffering. And if you deny that, or if you just feel the doom of that, if you have, if you're in the hope fear, hoping it can, it can change and fearing that it won't, right? If you're resentful of that, then that's hell. But post doom is when you accept that it, it's hope free, it's acceptance. When you accept that this is unstoppable, that this is undeniable, this is inevitable, then you can have a life full of joy and gratitude and compassionate, generous contribution to others because you're not in freak out because you understand, oh, this is inevitable, this is unstoppable. Here are my three definitions of doom and post doom. This is on the postdoom.com website. Doom is a normal feeling of disgust or dread upon realizing that technological progress and economic growth and development are the root of our predicament, not our way out. Doom is a name for the anxiety and fear called forth when living in a corrupt, dysfunctional civilization causing a mass extinction. And doom is the midpoint between denial and regeneration, with or without us. Life will regenerate. Earth will regenerate. That's what nature does. That's what life does. And uh, I call it compost theology. It's, it's, it's the nature of nature. Post-doom is what opens up when we remember who we are and how we got here, accept the inevitable, honor our grief, and prioritize what's pro-future and soul-nourishing. Post-doom is also a fierce and fearless reverence for life and expansive gratitude, even in the midst of abrupt climate mayhem and the runaway collapse of societal harmony, the health of the biosphere, and business as usual. And post-doom is living meaningfully, compassionately, and courageously, no matter what. And much of this program, much of the resources on the post to website is to help people understand who we are. We are the universe becoming conscious of itself. We're part of the universe. We're not separate from it. We're not superior to it. And how we got here is the story of evolution and ecology, honoring our grief, accepting the inevitable and prioritizing what's pro-future and soul nourishing. So here's the ecocidal pattern of all human-centered or anthropocentric civilizations. It's vital to understand this, because if you don't understand this, you're not going to understand the unstoppable nature of what we're dealing with. And again, this is just the last 5% of human history. More than 80 examples, probably well over 100 examples. The well-being of the elites and ruling class goes up. That is what gets called wealth and progress goes up. While the well-being of the bioregion and the habitat carrying capacity, that means there's a limit to how much we can take from the living world and a limit to how much we can exude before the systems start breaking down. That's known as carrying capacity. So that's real wealth, the well-being of the bioregion and the habitat. And where those cross over is uh, where the problem is. And you only understand this when you understand ecology, energy, and history. And these, these books right here, Columbus and Other Cannibals by Jack Forbes, uh, it's vital for understanding the sickness of the mind. Wetiko is the way it's spoken about in indigenous cultures. The, the sickness of the mind that anthropocentrism or human centeredness is. Profound book. You can't understand the last 8,000 years if you don't understand that. A Forest Journey by John Perlin details over and over again how we wipe out the trees, civilizations collapse because trees were the main form of energy. Geodestinies, the inevitable control of Earth's resources over nations and individuals. I was just a part of a team that got this republished for free as a PDF. This is a classic book from the 20th century. And then A New Green History of the World by Clive Ponting. These are essential for understanding this pattern in this our last 8,000 years. And then the classic book Overshoot by William Catton. Also, William Ophuls, this book, this little 75-page book, A Moderate Greatness, Why Civilizations Fail. He catalogs, basically, he takes an entire library of research on the rise and fall of civilizations and sums it up in 75 pages. I've recorded the audio of this, with his permission, of course. Um, and also his other little book, Apologies to the Grandchildren, Reflections on Our Ecological Predicament, Its Deeper Causes, and Its Political Consequences. I've also recorded that. In fact, here's the first paragraph, the very beginning of that book. Civilization is by its very nature a long-running Ponzi scheme. 
It lives by robbing nature and borrowing from the future, exploiting its hinterland until there's nothing left to exploit, after which it implodes. While it still lives, it generates a temporary and fictitious surplus that it uses to enrich and empower the few and to dispossess and to dominate the many. Industrial civilization is the apotheosis and quintessence of this fatal course. A fortunate minority gains luxuries and freedoms galore, but only by slaughtering, poisoning, and exhausting creation. We think of collapse like the collapse of a building. No, civilizations collapse over a long period of time. Forests collapse over a long period of time. Collapse is when a gradual downward trend in biophysical health and well-being goes into unstoppable decline, runaway, out of control, such as abrupt climate change. In fact, if you don't understand this, you're not going to understand that many of the redwood forests in California are in collapse because Connie's documented that in many cases, in most cases that she's documented, that unless the trees are being artificially watered, they're not producing babies, they're not producing cones. So industrial civilization, here's the last 270 years where a gradual downward trend goes into unstoppable decline, out of control, irreversible. It's known as the great acceleration. The stability of the biosphere has been in decline for centuries and an unstoppable out of control runaway mode for two to seven decades. And that's known as the great acceleration. Two decades ago is 2000, seven decades ago is the year 1950. If you just Google Great Acceleration, you'll find tons of stuff on the internet, and it shows all these charts, and everything's going up, which, you know, to the non-scientifically minded, you think, oh, that's getting better, right? No, it's not, because the socioeconomic trends and the earth system trends are actually ecocidal trends and measures of earth system collapse. That's what's really being measured here. So the Great Acceleration of Gaia and Collapse, and this is true no matter what you look at. The atmosphere, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, it's creating conditions that we can't survive, or not many of us, in fact, most mammals. Mass extinction of plants and animals. In fact, only one of the previous six great mass extinctions, and there's, there's actually some debate about you know, how many, but at least six, um, but only one of them did, the, did we lose the insects in the forests. And we're actually adding carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide at a faster rate than happened then. Oceans, plankton, coral reefs, fish, acidification, and deoxygenation, and sea level rise. Soil, the amount of soil, the fertility of the soil, the moisture of the soil, and of course, the permafrost that's now in unstoppable release of methane. We're going to lose the ice of the world, the Arctic sea ice, Antarctica, Greenland, the mountain glaciers, all the ice of the world is being lost. This is the great acceleration of Gaian collapse. So hopium is a comforting vision of the future that requires breaking the laws of physics, biology, or ecology, such as thinking that we can slow, stop, or reverse the great acceleration of biospheric collapse. It's vitally important to understand the difference between problems, which can be potentially solved, and predicaments, which can't. We have to adapt to them. Richard Heinberg famously says, our fundamental predicament is not climate change. It is overshoot of which global warming is a symptom. Because here's what we tend to focus on, right? Climate mayhem, the death of the oceans, plant and animal annihilation, topsoil poisoning and loss, critical resource depletion, chemical and nuclear wastes, growing gulf between the rich and the poor, economic instability and insanity, political polarization and conflict, the contracting of in-groups and the rise of totalitarianism and other isms, right? This is what we tend to focus on, certainly we activists, right? But all of these are not the problem, they are symptoms of ecological overshoot, of carrying capacity. And that's ultimately determined by how we define and measure wealth, well-being, and success. A lot of people don't know this. If we define and measure wealth, well-being, and success in human-centered terms, you know, the wealth of individuals, the wealth of kings, of emperors, or whatever, corporations, GDP, right, gross domestic product, if we measure wealth and well-being that way, it's insane, it's ecocidal. 
The only sane measures of wealth, well-being, and success are life-centered. How well is the soil doing decade by decade? How well are the forests doing decade by decade? How well are the other species doing decade by decade? That's the only sane measure of progress, success, wealth, and well-being. And notice these first three are already extinction level. They're already in runaway mode. Here are some of the planetary boundaries that have been identified, right? Even if we could solve climate, which we can't, we can't even come close, right? It's already in runaway. There are a half a dozen or more other planetary boundaries that we have already overshot. And here are things that are proposed, many activists, young activists, and the, the whole youth movement and all climate solutions that actually make things much worse. Nuclear, renewables, wind and solar, fusion, space colonization, carbon taxation and credits, electric cars, green economy, carbon sequestration, super batteries, biofuels. These will all make things much worse because they all exacerbate and extend ecological overshoot. I know this is painful to realize, but it's the truth. So long as abrupt climate change, or really any climate change, abrupt climate change is like 10,000 years of climate change in half a human lifetime, right? But so long as climate change is seen as a problem rather than a predicament, there is no chance of recovery from opium addiction. Global warming, climate change, pollution, these are but euphemisms for a long, slow, steady, and now unstoppable process of habitat destruction at a planetary scale. Here are three metaphors that I consider deadly accurate. Right? Industrial civilization is a demon devouring the living world and creating hell on earth. Those who advocate for so-called renewables, clean energy, or a green new deal are unknowingly proposing strategies to keep the demon on life support. Right? The only clean energy has chlorophyll working with it. If it's made with technology, if it requires mining, it's not clean, it's not green, and it's not renewable. Industrial civilization is a dead man walking. Homo colossus, man, and the difference between human and man is that man is a personification. That's why I'm doing that. So Homo colossus, man, is like a Chernobyl worker exposed to lethal radiation, and then nothing can stop the cascading failure of his organs and certain death. And Homo Colossus, industrial humanity, has stage four lung cancer. This is another metaphor. Arguing for green technology or an energy transition is like believing that organic cigarettes can restore health and win the fight against death. The only energy transition that will actually occur is from living to dying. Post-doom means kicking the hopium habit. How? By accepting and trusting what is factually inevitable. And what is that? Well, this book says, says it well in the title by Roy Scranton. We're doomed. Now what? That's post-doom. And I consider this the most important program I've created. It's kind of a hopium detox and recovery 101. All you can eat buffet of the 10 inevitables. I actually created two shorter versions, an appetizer and a, and a sort of a nourishing meal. But this is the full two-hour gourmet meal in six 20 minute serving. So this is basically 12,000 hours, nine years of research compressed into one video. And I encourage you to stop after each of the, the servings, each 20 minute sections. But this is, this is the most important video I've created. And I go through 10 things that I suggest that we're going to suffer and unknowingly participate in geological scale evil if we don't accept these 10 inevitables. Um, and I'm not going to you know, cover them all right now, but the last two our most people will crave distraction and virtually anything that offers hope. That's an inevitable. And elite universities, the IPCC, that is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the mainstream media, politicians, and New York Times bestselling authors will remain first-rate legal hopium dealers. Yeah, there'll be plenty of stuff on the black market, but these are the legal ones. And I will do a separate video. I was going to have it as part of this, but it would just make this too long. I want to keep this shorter. But I'm going to have a video titled Hopium Dealers Hall of Fame, where I talk about all of the, the profoundly best-selling and uh, authoritative and trusted 
opium dealers. I was one <laughs> for 12 years. So coming back here to the definition of hopium, a comforting vision of the future that requires breaking the laws of physics, biology, or ecology, addiction to false, literally impossible hopes, and irrational or unwarranted optimism that promises short-term relief, but delivers crushing disappointment and despair when reality inevitably bites. Hopium leads good people to unnecessarily suffer and unknowingly increase the likelihood of even more nuclear meltdowns and species extinction. I mean, make no mistake, there's gonna be nuclear meltdowns. There are gonna be species extinction, no matter what, but it doesn't have to be an excessive. If, if we only have a dozen nuclear meltdowns in the next 20 or 30 years, that's better than 100 or 200. Here's some examples of hopium. Believing that enough people can become climate aware in time to transform society and save Homo Colossus. Believing that there's still plenty of time to figure out how to safely, permanently store spent nuclear fuel rods. Believing that human cleverness, technology, or the market can halt the ecocide that they always inevitably create. Believing that we can stop or reverse abrupt climate mayhem or biospheric and societal collapse. And believing that we can or will return to normal unaware of the fact that normal is precisely why we are so, yeah. Here are those who are most vulnerable. Young people who expect a life like their parents or grandparents had. High schoolers agonizing whether college and college debt is worth it. Couples trying to decide on marriage or whether to become parents. Parents of young children and teenagers still living at home. Older generations who are terrified or consumed with guilt when considering the world their adult children and grandchildren will inherit. And then more generically, that those are more specific, concrete, more generically or abstractly, any and all who lack an ecological understanding of history, those who are unwilling or unable to trust reality as it really is, and devout believers in the civil religion of perpetual progress. And that's the thing. Human-centered progress is always ecocidal. I did back in 2019, a little 24-minute video. I, at the time, called it my Pinker takedown video. But sane versus insane progress. And then I did a much more in-depth, thorough version in 2020. Collapse 101, the inevitable fruit of progress. So these two of my great mentors, William Catton and Thomas Berry, these quotes just nail it. Human society is inextricably part of a global biotic community. And in that community, human dominance has had and is having self-destructive consequences. And then Thomas Berry along similar lines, the most difficult transition to make is from a human-centered to a life-centered norm of progress. If there's to be any true progress, the entire life community must progress. Any so-called progress of the human at the expense of the larger life community must ultimately lead to a diminishment of human life itself. Progressing toward ecocide, these were the main points I made in that sane versus insane progress video. To collectively define and measure progress in short-term, human-centered, and anti-future, that is, ecocidal ways, is insane if anything is. Banking on technofix or political solutions will lead to catastrophic nuclear meltdowns and incalculable extinctions. Problems caused by economic growth and development will not be solved by more of the same. Indeed, our predicament will worsen. And understanding ecology, energy, and history undermines expectations that human ingenuity, technology, or the market can save industrial civilization. Turns out that ingenuity, technology, and the market are what is causing the ecocide we're now experiencing. True sustainability requires God-centeredness, not God as a supernatural otherworldly being, but reality with a personality. That's why I have the earth emoji, G, earth emoji D. And uh, that's what I mean, it's life-centeredness, ecocentrism. And this 70-minute this video, Sustainability 101, indigenuity is not optional, is a vital. In fact, the last 
20 minutes, 25 minutes, I take a look at all the core aspects of Christianity, and this could be done with any religious tradition, and then interpret them from not a human-centered perspective, but a life-centered, truly God-centered, but life-centered perspective. And then this one, God, owning our error, accepting our fate. If you're interested in any of the spirituality and theological stuff around this, eco-theological, I'm a religious naturalist, check out these two videos. And then just a real short one, a little 14-minute one I did recently. My God, what have we done? That was said by the co-pilot of the person who dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima. My God, what have we done? Every truly sustainable culture had an eco-theo worldview. That is where ecology was the heart of their theology. Thomas Berry said it well. Our fundamental problem is that we no longer listen to what the earth its landscape and atmospheric phenomena, its mountains and valleys, and all the flora and fauna of the planet are telling us. I suggest that this is the ecocidal delusion, the fundamental error in our thinking that leads to all the other problems and predicaments, that God is either otherworldly or doesn't exist. Theism and atheism both miss it. Or that earth is a lesser it, not a greater thou. These are two sides of the same coin. God is either otherworldly or doesn't exist, or that earth is a lesser it, not a greater thou. I suggest that the theism versus atheism debate is a form of collective insanity. You've got thousands, maybe millions of people debating whether or not God is real, or whether or not God exists, when the one real God, namely reality, personified or not, we've been living out of right relationship to, and we are now experiencing consequences of biblical proportion. And people are debating whether or not God exists. It's an utter insanity. One of my favorite movies, in fact, probably my favorite movie is this one. And a lot of people don't get it because they don't understand that this is gallows humor. That's what this whole movie is, gallows humor. I like Neil deGrasse Tyson's comment. He says, I finally watched the, the Netflix film, Don't Look Up, the fictional tale of a nation distracted by pop culture and divided on whether to heed dire warnings of scientists. Everything I know about the news cycles, talk shows, social media, and politics tells me the film was instead a documentary. Because here's the uncomfortable truth, painful truth. A comet actually is heading our way. We ourselves set it in motion millennia ago. But only recently have scientists, echoing longstanding indigenous warnings, charted its course and voiced the alarm. Its name is anthropocentrism. In religious language, mythic language, it's idolatry. And these are the end times because human-centeredness, as opposed to God-centeredness, that is life-centeredness, will prove to be just as unstoppable and nearly as deadly as the comment in the movie. So this is the last section, very short. We must take action, right? This is what people in inevitably want to do. Like, okay, now what? Well, Ecological understanding of the human predicament indicates that we live in times when the habit of asking, all right, now what must we do about it, must be replaced by a different query that does not assume all problems have solutions or soluble. What must we avoid doing to keep from making a bad situation unnecessarily worse? Because to avoid making things worse and to stay sane, we need to faithfully reject technology and market-based so-called solutions. And I say faithful because remember, fidelity, faithfulness to the future is the de definition of true sustainability. So rejecting technology and market-based solutions, to faithfully do that. To determine which actions help and which ones harm. That is, which actions reduce ecological overshoot and which exacerbate or extend ecological overshoot discern what is out of our control and what we can still potentially start, stop, shift, change, or transform. And then regularly remind ourselves, which is difficult in light of a multi-billion dollar greenwash propaganda campaign, of what it is too late for and what it's not too late for. It is too late for these four things. It's too late to slow, stop, or reverse abrupt climate mayhem and the accelerating collapse of the biosphere and business as usual. It is too late to prevent the loss of most of the world's forests, ice, insects, coral reefs, and protective ozone layer. A lot more, but I'll just stop there. 
It's too late to spare Homo Colossus the ecocidal consequences of human ingenuity, technology, and the market. And it's too late to prevent billions of humans and other mammals and vertebrates from dying this decade or next. It's not too late for anything and everything that promotes ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. And there's a lot that's in there. It's not too late to pursue with passion, with love, with, com with compassion, with generosity, everything and anything that contributes to ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness. It's not too late to reduce suffering and adapt to less. That's John Michael Greer talks about L-E-S-S, -S, less energy, less stuff, less stimulation. It's not too late to reduce suffering and to adapt to less. It's not too late to resist further destruction and evil. It's not too late to assist trees and other plants in migrating. Turns out the difference between hundreds or thousands of species of trees going extinct this century and those same, or at least a good portion of them potentially making it through this bottleneck is entirely dependent upon humans assisting them in migrating. This is one of my wife, Connie Barlow's major passions. It's not too late to support indigenous resistance. As I said before, that's where biodiversity is being protected and defended most fiercely and most effectively. It's not too late to engage in regenerative love and action in a multiplicity of ways. It's not too late to be a blessing to your friends, your family and community. I mean, it's not too late to be a loving person. So here again, I showed this slide before, but it's so important. Hopium, that is the secular religion of perpetual progress, blinds us from acknowledging the urgency for investing time, energy, and resources in all things regenerative, supporting indigenous resistance values and life ways, sequestering human-made toxins that nature cannot undo, safely dismantling the relics of infrastructure no longer in use, rewilding rivers and other animal migration pathways, and assisting plants, especially trees, in migrating poleward. This is important. Fossil fuels and industrial machinery are indispensable in this process. Seriously, there's no time to waste. And how can we know this? Well, here's a quote. For now, food just costs more than ever. Wait until it's simply unavailable. Nobody will care about anything else after that. There's a use for fossil fuels, but it's not to try to promote a green economy, which is a delusion. It's to basically attend to this kind of stuff. Collapse awareness is a booby prize. And while acceptance can be redemptive, it is trust that transforms lives. And I highly recommend, I've had 81 post-doom conversations, and I highly recommend this one. I just recently had Karen Perry, 15 Benefits of Collapse Acceptance. And then Jordan Perry, her husband, I just had a conversation with him on 14 post-doom actions. These are fully accepting collapse, fully accepting unstoppable collapse, and quite possibly extinction of our species, and yet post-doom love and action, acceptance. And then the two of them together had a conversation with David Baum that I thought was so great, he allowed me to repurpose it here on the post-doom site, which is getting real about collapse, a conversation with both of them. And the two of them are actually leading, I'll say more about that at the end, the, the post-doom bloom and post-doom no gloom conversations that are happening on a bi-weekly basis. The benefits of trusting what is inevitable, post-doom collapse acceptance, just, just a few. Clarity replaces confusion, compassion replaces blame, and love and action over desperate activism. It reprioritizes nearly everything around what matters most and what doesn't. A calm urgency to get complete with self, family, others, life, and legacy. Even if our species goes extinct, which is a very real possibility in the next several decades, that doesn't mean that we can't have a positive legacy, like, for example, helping trees. Focusing attention on home, family, community, what's local, what's joyful, what's meaningful. It frees us from shoulds, oughts, have tos, and freedom for coulds, might get tos. And most people experience an overwhelming gratitude 
for the gift of simply being alive, aware, and able to feel deeply. And feeling, including feeling grief. And then an expanded sense of self. We no longer identify with what Alan Watts called the skin encapsulated ego, that our larger self is Gaia, is Earth, is the Milky Way, is the universe as a whole, it's reality as a whole, and of impermanence and death as sacred. Connie and I do whole programs on this. The resources page of the Postum website is really an entire program, an entire graduate level program in clarity, sanity, and minimizing suffering. For example, here I have this one that's on this page, the best videos for understanding reality and the best videos for coping and adapting to reality, such as these two, Collapse in a Nutshell and Overshoot in a Nutshell. These are just half hour videos, but these are the only videos I've ever created that went viral. The, the, the first 15 days that I uploaded these, they were generating 10,000 new views every day for the first 15 days. That's never happened to me before. And then post gloom, deeply adapting to reality and beyond hope and fear, clarity, compassion, courageous love and action. These are videos about coping, adapting and calm gratitude in the face of what's inevitable and unstoppable collapse. And then these, if you ignore my videos, that's fine, but make sure you take time for these audio and text. I highly recommend these resources there. Please make time for them. Also the conversations, as I said, I've had 81 conversations. I already mentioned that those and showed those with Jordan Perry and Karen Perry, but these two, I especially recommend my post-doom conversation with Joanna Macy to collapse well, and then Meg Wheatley, Margaret Wheatley, opening to the world, two amazing mentors and the older sisters on the path. And then, as I mentioned, Jordan Perry and Karen Perry facilitate twice weekly post doom, no gloom general, and then the post doom bloom women's circle. So definitely check out the information there on how to access those. Thank you for watching. Please share this with others.